body. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Lights Out Podcast. I'm your host, Josh. As always, I've got my producer and brother, Joel, here in the studio with me as well. And today we are going to be diving into the terrifying legend of the Wendigo. If you've never heard of the Wendigo, it's a terrifying creature. It's a really like a spiritual beast, really. It's like the skinwalker in a right. lot of ways. It comes from Native American folklore. Mm-hmm. And, you know, a lot of people claim that it's real and have had encounters with it. So that is what we're covering today. And just so you know, if you hear thunder or you hear the sound of rain pitter pattering <laughs> on our roof, it's because we're filming this during a thunderstorm. Yep. No added effects, all natural. Right. Yep. So. You know, it worked out really well in our favor that Mm -hmm. uh, we got a thunderstorm for this episode because, man, this one is spooky. Oh, yeah. Before we dive into everything, though, I do have a few quick announcements. First announcement is, is that I'm launching another podcast. In case you didn't see, I announced on Twitter and on, you know, the Lights Out feed that I'm launching a new podcast called Planet Sleep. And the purpose of this podcast is exactly what you think it is. It's to put you to sleep because... It hurts me to see so many people that fall asleep to this show, (laughs) (laughs) which I I guess, you know, everybody has their thing. It makes sense. Maybe my voice is just that soothing that you can't help it and you literally fall asleep. Yeah. I saw a comment from somebody that commented on the Planet Sleep podcast that said they watch lights out to fall asleep and, you know, that it works, but subconsciously they have no idea how fucked up things are getting there because you know you're listening to your subconscious is listening Mm -hmm. to horrific things and violence and hauntings (laughs) and everything else so and i could only imagine how much that has an effect on your dreams oh (laughs) yeah oh yeah subconsciously absolutely i mean i think your subconscious has a lot to do with what you dream about so like (laughs) hopefully i'm not giving people nightmares but if i am i apologize Uh. and hopefully planet sleep will be a remedy for you so In a nutshell, Planet Sleep is going to be a nature-based sleep podcast where I talk about all things nature, different places across the globe, to chill music provided by Joel. Joel's producing the show, so he's doing all the editing and really putting everything together. If that sounds like something you might be interested in, we'll put all the links below to check everything out. The first episode actually releases on July 26th is when we'll be releasing the first episode. And then it'll be every Monday from uh, there on out. And there'll be a new episode exploring some other part of the earth or even beyond. Might even head into space one day. So very excited about that. We've been working on it for quite a while now and it's really cool to see it all come together. Absolutely. The other thing I wanted to mention real quick is my CBD company, Higher Love Wellness. We just released a new flavor of CBD oil and CBD wax called Watermelon Haze. Really excited about it because it's, you know, it's summertime, who doesn't love watermelon? So it's got, you know, fruity notes of watermelon in there. And it, you know, the oil comes in 500 milligrams, thousand milligrams, and then the CBD wax is just jam packed with CBD. I mean, it's one of the most efficient ways to consume CBD and use that with our Terp pen and all the information's on our website. But what I really want to let you know is that we are running probably our biggest sale of the year when it comes to our concentrates. So our wax and our oils are gonna be 30% off on July 10th. Nice. And that's gonna be for 24 hours that we'll be running that from midnight on July 9th all the way through midnight of July 10th. You'll get 30% off all of our waxes and all of our CBD oil. So if you've been thinking about trying CBD or maybe you know you need to stock up, July 10th is the day. So I'll put the link to my store below so that you can go on there and actually enter your email so you can be notified when that sale goes live and when that new flavor drops. And lastly, this episode of Lights Out is brought to you by Raycon Honey and Plush Care. But let's go ahead and get into the legend of the Wendigo. The existence of the Wendigo can be traced back to the Algonquin people, which is made up by several indigenous tribes from North America, but mainly in Eastern Canada. And they had a strong clan system that kept them united for centuries. And the legend of the Wendigo had a surprisingly important role to play in helping these tribes survive and prosper. The Wendigo is the embodiment of pure evil and the worst taboo imaginable because it eats the flesh of fellow humans. Even if people are starving to death and watching their companions drop dead of natural causes, resorting to cannibalism is always viewed as an act of pure evil. If someone is so desperate that they start to consider eating human flesh, they should let themselves starve to death 
or take their own life in order to avoid becoming a Wendigo. People who spoke the Algonquin language lived as far south as Virginia and as far west as the Rocky Mountains. The language was heavily influenced by the Cree language, which is still spoken by about 117,000 people in Canada. There's actually multiple spellings and pronunciations of Wendigo, and it has also been referred to as Achin, Chinu, and Kiwak. Today, members of the tribe live mostly in Quebec, Canada, but some live in Ontario, where there continue to be reported Wendigo encounters to this day. Before being converted to Catholicism by French missionaries, the Algonquin people practice Midwaywin, a secretive religion also called the Grand Medicine Society or the Way of the Heart. There are many words and concepts related to this religion that have no English translation, which only adds to its mystery. Archaeologists believe that some Midwaywin rituals may have not been performed at sites where the Wendigo lived and devoured its prey, but no one knows for sure, because the origin of the Wendigo wasn't actually written down. In fact, it was passed down through the oral traditions of a multitude of different tribes, all who speak the Algonquin language. Midway Wind practitioners are ranked by degrees and have to complete specific tasks and master certain knowledge before advancing to the next degree. And these degrees are like doctorate degrees and postdoctorate degrees, but in spiritual medicine. In some traditions, the only people who can kill a Wendigo are those who have achieved a certain ranking as a practitioner and spiritual leader. Part of the oral history of the Algonquin people is the Seven Fires Prophecy, which represents key spiritual teachings and knowledge of all religious rituals. The prophecies were told by eight prophets who lived in seven separate time periods, and each prophecy is called a fire. According to these teachings, the planet will become befouled and the waters turn bitter by disrespect. When this happens, humans will have to choose between materialism and spirituality, and this choice will determine if we perish or survive. The seven fires prophecy seems to be coming true in our modern world that's dominated by consumerism and plagued by climate change, leading many to believe other stories from Algonquin traditions, including the legend of the Wendigo. According to the oral history of Algonquin-speaking tribes, the legend was first told by a man who was expelled from his tribe many years ago. He and his family were exiled to the forest and had to walk day and night to find other signs of civilization. Finally, the man reached a city though, and when he found people, he told them he was starving and desperate, and he begged them for help. The man explained that he was banished with his family, and they had all died of starvation while traveling through the forest. He left their bodies in the wilderness though and pressed on alone. The people in the city were very skeptical of his story though, because he didn't look like a man who was near death from starvation. So they called in the local authorities to investigate. And after hours of questioning, the man finally broke down and admitted that he and his family had actually found a cabin in the forest where they were living. But there wasn't enough food and his family died there. The authorities insisted he bring them to this cabin of his so they could see for themselves that his family was dead and also to bring their bodies back to the city for a proper burial. When they got to the cabin, they immediately realized that the people there hadn't died of starvation. But that wasn't the worst of it. The bodies of the man's wife and children were torn apart and scattered, with chunks of flesh being torn away and eaten. The man frantically tried to explain it wasn't his fault. A terrible creature had possessed him and forced him to murder his family. The creature then made him rip apart their bodies and eat their flesh. But, as you can imagine, the authorities didn't believe it, and they sentenced the man to death by hanging as a result. But the Algonquin people know that the creature the man described was real. It was the Wendigo. There are multiple stories about the origin of the Wendigo. In one version, a great warrior made a deal with the devil to save his tribe from extinction, and in exchange, the warrior sold his soul. The devil turned him into a Wendigo, and he was banished from the tribe forever. In another version, a man ventured out into the wilderness during a brutally cold winter to find food for his family. He wandered the wilderness, desperately looking for any animals to hunt. He hadn't eaten in days, and he was weak and disoriented, and he ended up lost in the middle of nowhere. As he continued to wander, his feet were frozen in his shoes, and he could barely feel his fingers. He was absolutely starving and desperate. 
when finally he saw another person in the woods. A fellow hunter came toward him and offered to help. Instead of accepting help from the stranger though, he attacked. He lunged at the man and started ripping him apart. The man screamed and pleaded with him to stop tearing him to pieces, but the hunter just kept on going. Crazed from hunger and exhaustion, the hunter had been driven to murder and then cannibalism. He ate the man's flesh and even drank his blood. After he was finished, he collapsed in the snow and fell into a deep sleep. When he woke up, he had lost the connection to his human consciousness. He was no longer human, in fact. The hunter had transformed into a violent, insatiable man-beast, desperate for another taste of human flesh. He had become a Wendigo. The Wendigo roams the northern forests of the U.S. and Canada searching for victims. Most sightings have been in northern Minnesota, around the Great Lakes, and in central Canada. Some stories of the Wendigo claim that the beast is related to Bigfoot. Others say it's actually a werewolf. And after it feasts on human flesh, it transforms back into a man. In the early 1900s, members of the Algonquin tribe sounded the alarm about multiple people who had disappeared from northern states in the U.S. and from eastern Canada. They said these people were victims of Wendigo attacks and had been eaten by the beast. The Wendigo prefers to hunt in cold weather, which makes it much more dangerous to be out during winter snowstorms. According to those who have seen it, the Wendigo is almost 15 feet tall with a skeletal frame. Its ribs are clearly visible under its thin skin, and the beast looks like it's wasting away with its dull gray or yellowish skin pulled tight over its bones. The skin is covered in tufts of fur and is leaking pus. On the top of its head, the Wendigo retains what looks like strands of hair, one leftover sign that it used to be human. The beast's huge glowing eyes sit deep in its sockets, and what's left of its lips hang loosely over its jagged teeth, yellow fangs and a long frog-like tongue. Its massive antlers rise from its head into sharp spears that can be used to impale victims. It can have animal-like ears and a snout, or it can look more like a humanoid. The Wendigo has long, thin legs and arms and can walk upright, but it moves more quickly through the forest by running on all fours. The hands have long, razor-sharp talons and the feet look like hooves. According to some stories, the beast has a heart of ice and a deformed body, and it's even missing parts of its toes and lips from living in the freezing cold. Despite these specific physical characteristics, many believe that no one has actually seen a Wendigo and lived to tell about it. In fact, the beast is believed to be so frightening that if someone were to see it up close, they would immediately die from just sheer terror and fear. A Wendigo may be killed by bashing, cutting, or shooting it, but it's not easy. Its skin may look like the flesh of a rotting corpse, but it's as tough as the strongest metal shield. According to some stories, the only way to kill the beast is to cut out its icy heart and melt it in a fire. In fact, the fire is the only possible weapon that can protect someone from a Wendigo attack. Some believe that the Wendigo will come back to life unless a spiritual leader performs a highly specific ritual that kills the original human who turned into the beast and still lives within it. A Wendigo may also grow larger each time it eats human flesh. The Wendigo's skeletal frame eventually becomes muscular and strong, making it much more dangerous with each new victim. As it grows larger, it also needs more food to sustain itself. The Wendigo is never truly satisfied and will always need to kill more and more victims to keep itself alive. It's doomed to a life of everlasting hunger, and no matter how many humans the Wendigo devours, it will never be enough. When it breathes, it makes a disturbing, hissing sound. And as it walks, it leaves footprints filled with blood and the ice and snow. It's covered in blood and bits of flesh, and it brings with it the stench of death. Its breath and body odor are enough to stop anyone in their tracks and can be smelled from a great distance away. Despite its skeletal frame, the Wendigo has extraordinary strength and unbelievable stamina. It can stay upright and alert for extremely long periods of time while stalking its prey. The beast has a heightened sense of smell, eyesight, and hearing and can sense when humans are in its territory. Deep snow and vast bodies of water won't protect someone from the Wendigo, as it can glide right over snow and water at incredible speeds without ever sinking. 
According to some stories, the Wendigo can sprint through the forest at incredible speeds. Others say it stumbles around, barely able to stay upright. How the beast moves may depend on how long it's been since it's devoured its last victim, though. The Wendigo has another skill that helps catch its prey. It can mimic human voices. The beast silently approaches the edge of the forest, and when people come by, it calls out for help. Some say a Wendigo can impersonate the last person it killed, taking on their voice and personality. The beast may even be able to take on the person's form in order to trick their next victim. When the people hear the cries for help in the forest, they walk toward the voice. And as the Wendigo creeps back through the wilderness, occasionally crying out, it lures its victims deeper and deeper into the forest. The beast knows its hunting grounds inside and out and prefers to hunt after sunset. It has exceptional night vision, which gives the Wendigo another huge advantage over its human prey. And in order to trap its victims, the Wendigo can also manipulate the weather, dropping the temperature to dangerously low levels and increasing the amount of ice and snow. No matter where someone goes, the Wendigo can follow. Its long arms and fingers and sharp talons allow the beast to climb over virtually anything, including scaling tall rock walls and reaching the tops of trees. Once the victims are far enough away from civilization, the Wendigo emerges from the trees and pounces on its prey, ripping people apart and devouring their flesh. Sometimes the Wendigo lifts a victim into the air and over its head before pulling them apart, allowing for the blood to rain down on top of the Wendigo, which just whets its appetite for the human feast ahead. Another skill is the ability to possess humans, exactly what happened to the hunter who killed and ate his family. The evil beast can take over the mind of a human being. Just like the Wendigo, the person will become crazed and violent and will begin to crave human flesh. And people are more susceptible to being possessed by the Wendigo if they've gone without food for a long time and are desperate and starving. Once possessed, the person becomes a Wendigo and relentlessly stalks their loved ones. And the first chance they get, they attack and kill their family and friends and then eat them. To help ward off of Wendigo possession, tribes would perform ceremonial dance rituals during the coldest months of the year and whenever food supplies ran low. A Wendigo may also possess someone when they're sleeping. They can infiltrate a person's mind at night and take control of their dreams. And when the person wakes up, they feel an overwhelming lust for violence and an uncontrollable craving for human flesh. Every version of The Legend of the Wendigo describes it as being profoundly evil and an enemy to mankind. In some stories, any person who resorts to cannibalism to survive may become a Wendigo and is then doomed to a life of hunting and eating human flesh. It doesn't start out as an evil act. When groups of people are stranded together in the woods, especially in freezing temperature, someone may die of natural causes. Once the person is dead, eating their flesh to survive may seem like the only option. If someone even thinks about resorting to cannibalism, they may be overtaken by the Wendigo and forced to go through with this fleeting, desperate impulse. After the person gets a taste for humans, they become a Wendigo and must continue to find new prey. If a Wendigo goes too long without finding a victim to eat, it will starve to death. Someone may also become a Wendigo if they're extremely greedy, materialistic, or self-destructive. The fear of being possessed by the creature encouraged the members of tribes to take care of each other and not be overtaken by greed or selfishness. It also discouraged people from becoming too individualistic. In a tribal society, there always has to be a strong emphasis on communal living, sharing food and resources, and always staying together. Otherwise, no one would survive. The tribes believe that human beings are selfish, violent, and primitive by nature, and have to fight against these natural instincts to avoid becoming a dreadful Wendigo. Many anthropologists theorize that this belief system stemmed from the violence against native people by European settlers. They couldn't fathom being raped, murdered, and driven from their home by fellow humans. And the only reasonable explanation was that the settlers were possessed by the Wendigo, a symbol of pure evil. And as their land and resources were stripped away, the tribes became more desperate. They watched their food supplies disappear, and their friends and family members were dying of starvation before their very eyes and there was nothing they could do about it. This desperation led to an increase in Wendigo possession, 
amongst members of the tribe. The legend of the Wendigo is thought of as a metaphor for other injustices endured by native people, such as stripping away their rights and freedoms and confining them to reservations or residential schools. The generational trauma caused by residential schools was depicted in the 2010 film, A Wendigo Tale. The monster is an embodiment of colonization and imperialism. The Wendigo has had a surprising influence on modern medicine. Wendigo psychosis is a legitimate medical diagnosis to many psychiatrists and has become a part of the vocabulary of Western medicine. This psychosis is diagnosed when a person craves human flesh or has an intense fear that they will become a cannibal. The term was coined by a missionary named J.E. Sandin in the 1920s, and he was living with the Cree people near the Hudson Bay in Canada. And one day he talked to a woman who told him a terrifying story. She had met two strangers who were wild and frantic, and right away she knew that she was in danger and immediately tried to flee the area. But these strangers grabbed her. They had a crazed look in their eyes as they gnashed their teeth and clawed at her skin. She struggled to get away from them, but eventually fought them off, as she knew that they wanted to kill her and eat her flesh. As she told the story, she kept looking around, paranoid that the strangers were still after her, and by the time she was done, she was shaking with fear. J.E. Sandin diagnosed her with psychoneurosis, a disorder later renamed the Wendigo psychosis. There is still debate in the medical community of whether or not Wendigo psychosis is real and how it should be classified. Others believe it's a real affliction and not a mental disorder at all. It's really just the beginning stages of becoming a Wendigo. Wendigo psychosis usually affects people who live around the Great Lakes in the US and Canada, especially during the coldest months of the year. People are more susceptible if they have been isolated from others for an extended period of time. The easiest way to become a Wendigo is to be cold, isolated, and starving. The earliest symptoms are nausea and poor appetite followed by vomiting and then delusional thinking. The person starts to view other humans as being edible, like any other type of food. The fear of becoming a cannibal is similar to a fear of falling when looking out over a cliff. Even someone who has no desire to jump over the cliff might be afraid that they could involuntarily jump. There were documented cases of Wendigo psychosis hundreds of years ago. If tribes suspected this affliction in someone, a healer would try to treat the possession before the person turned violent. But as soon as the person became threatening, violent, or even too antisocial, they would be put to death in order to protect the rest of the tribe. Before we talk about some more encounters with the Wendigo, we're going to take a quick ad break and we'll be right back. I don't know about you, but I shop online for pretty much everything. I hardly ever go to the store to buy things anymore. Everything is done online from the comfort of my bed. And one tool that I use every single time I go online and start shopping is Honey. If you've never used Honey before, I don't know what you're doing or where you're living because this browser extension will absolutely change your shopping world. Just the other day I was online buying some more clothes and even just buying food for dinner via the delivery apps and I used Honey in order to save me some serious dough on both of those purchases. What's great about Honey is they take the guesswork out of finding coupon codes. You know, we all used to do that in the past, but now Honey does it all automatically for you. It's super, super easy to install. It's a really cool browser extension. It literally takes two clicks and then it automatically prompts you to search for coupon codes at checkout. And it goes out and scours the entire internet to find you the best code and then automatically applies it for you. Honey supports over 30,000 stores online. I mean, they range from all different types of websites, from tech and gaming products to fashion brands, and like I said, even food delivery. Nothing brings me more joy than watching my cart total drop significantly in price, all thanks to Honey. I'm not the only person that Honey has found savings for. In fact, it's found over $2 billion in savings for its 17 million members. If you don't already have Honey, you could be straight up missing out on free savings. It's literally free, and it installs in a few seconds. And by getting it, you'll be doing yourself a solid and supporting this podcast. I never recommend something I don't use, and I gotta say, I use Honey literally all the time. And right now, you can get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash lights out. That's joinhoney.com slash lights out. Let's face it, 
We probably all have something we should see a doctor about, but have been putting it off because it is such a pain to make a doctor's appointment for most offices. But I'm here to tell you today that Plush Care is here for you. They make it super easy to schedule an appointment and see a doctor so you can prioritize your health hassle-free. That's what I did. Plush Care provides virtual doctor's appointments right through your smartphone or computer. When I did it, I just literally picked a time that worked for me and the times are like all the time, pretty much. And once you pick your time, your appointment's all set. You don't have to sit on hold forever to make an appointment or leave the house even and sit in a crowded, dirty waiting room. With Plush Care, I can be diagnosed, treated, and even have a prescription sent to my pharmacy of choice if needed within minutes. Best of all, Plush Care accepts most major insurance carriers and is available in all 50 states, and the doctors actually care. They're here to help by discussing treatment options and providing prescriptions as needed, and they're available anytime that I have questions. And if you're having difficulty managing your emotions, I mean, who isn't these days? Plush Care doctors are available to help you out. Schedule an appointment today to discuss your treatment options. It's literally the most easy service out there to schedule a doctor's appointment. I mean, if you haven't tried it out yet, definitely do. I mean, it's way better than anything else I've ever used before because Plush Care makes it easier than ever to take care of yourself inside and out. And you can start your membership today by going to plushcare.com slash lights out to start your free 30-day trial. That's P-L-U-S-H-C-A-R-E dot com slash lights out for a free 30-day trial. Why not give it a shot? plushcare.com slash lights out. And our last sponsor for today is Raycon. If you've never used Raycon's wireless earbuds or headphones, then you're absolutely missing out. I absolutely love this brand and I love their product. I take my Raycon wireless earbuds literally everywhere with me on vacation to the gym. And now my latest thing has been listening to podcasts and Alan Watts lectures in bed at night. And they are the only earbuds that are actually comfortable to have in my ears while I'm laying down on my side. So that's why I absolutely love them. But not only that, the Raycon wireless earbuds actually do provide crisp and powerful audio at half the price of other premium audio brands. They look great, they come in different colors and they feel even better. They come with customizable gel tips, which helps you give you a comfortable in-ear fit. And they're built to go wherever you go with a quick and seamless Bluetooth pairing and a compact charging case. I feel like I never have to charge these Raycons because they have a 24 hour battery life, which is really cool. And they obviously charge right inside the case. So you can literally take them anywhere and you never have to worry about, you know, not having your audio with you. So listen up, Raycon's offering 15% off all their products for my listeners. And here's what you gotta do to go and get it. Go to buyraycon.com slash lights out and there you'll get 15% off your entire Raycon order. And it's such a good deal that you wanna grab a pair and a spare. They have the earbuds and the over-ear headphones too. And that's 15% off at buyraycon.com slash lights out. Buyraycon.com slash lights out today. The legend of the Wendigo actually shows up in the European records. In fact, the first European record of a Wendigo was documented by a Jesuit missionary named Paul Lejeune. And Paul lived with the Algonquin people in the 1600s. In 1636, he wrote about a Wendigo that attacked the tribes in the north and devoured many of their people. Another recorded case was included in the Jesuit Relations and Allied Documents in 1661, and the writer describes a group of men who were afflicted with a strange illness. It was a combination of mania, delusional thinking, and hypochondria. The men had a canine-like hunger and were desperate to eat human flesh. They stalked women, children, and even other men, and violently attacked them. They murdered their victims and actually ate them. But after the bones were picked clean, the men immediately wanted more, because that insatiable craving never stopped. The document said they were basically werewolves, and the only cure was to capture them and put them to death. And from the late 1800s through the 1920s, there were multiple reports of a Wendigo in northern Minnesota. Every time a Wendigo was reported to be seen in the area, someone close by would mysteriously disappear, never to be seen again. Employees who worked at trading posts of the Hudson's Bay Company kept records of Wendigo sightings described by the native people. Spiritual leaders described first-hand accounts of watching a person literally turning into a Wendigo. In one of these accounts, a Cree spiritual leader or shaman had to be killed by members of his own tribe. His name was Abishabis, 
and he became suddenly violent and was overwhelmed by bloodlust and greed. So in a frenzy, he attacked and murdered his entire family, and three of his followers decided they were the only ones who could stop him. They struggled to overpower the usually calm and gentle spiritual leader. He seemed to all of a sudden have superhuman strength and fought viciously like a wild animal. The men were finally able to wrestle him to the ground and kill him before he turned into a full-blown wendigo. If that had happened, they feared he'd kill them all. There was another well-documented case in 1878. That winter, a member of a Cree tribe named Swift Runner was struggling to take care of his wife and children. They had run out of food and the weather was too harsh to travel. After their oldest son died of starvation, Swift Runner's wife insisted they brave the storm to get emergency supplies at a Hudson Bay's company trading post 25 miles away. But Swift Runner refused. The more desperate the situation became, the more he seemed to lose his mind. He started to view his family members as potential food and started craving their blood. Eventually, he attacked and murdered them one by one and then ate their flesh. After the winter storm passed, Swift Runner was found and he confessed that he had killed and eaten his family. But it wasn't really him that did it. His mind had been overtaken by the Wendigo. He had no control over his body and had to watch helplessly from the depths of his mind as his hands and teeth ripped the flesh from his wife and children. The authorities didn't believe him. They just assumed he was some psycho madman. And before he could kill again, he was sentenced to death and hung at Fort Saskatchewan. Another man named Jack Fiddler, who was a tribal chief and medicine man, had a rare ability to overpower and kill a Wendigo. There was actually 14 documented cases of Jack killing these beasts. Some of them had been unleashed on his tribe by their enemies, and in other cases, members of the tribe would come to him to kill a family member who they believed was turning into a Wendigo. Occasionally, an afflicted person would even ask Jack to kill them personally. Jack and his brother, Peter Flett, were on a trading expedition when they ran out of food. Peter was desperate to survive, but started craving human flesh. And when he turned violent, Jack didn't hesitate to kill him before he became a Wendigo. In October 1907, 87-year-old Jack and his other brother Joseph were arrested in Canada and charged with the murder of Joseph's daughter-in-law. Jack defended himself and said he only killed the woman because she was turning into a Wendigo. And he really thought of himself as a hero, not as a murderer. But the authorities refused to listen. Instead of going to trial for murder, Jack was able to escape prison and hung himself. He was found dead that same day. During Joseph's trial, an eyewitness named Angus Ray testified that his daughter-in-law had an incurable sickness and was in a lot of pain when she was killed. Missionaries and employees from Hudson's Bay Company actually testified on Joseph's behalf, though, and they said that the woman had been humanely euthanized and that the tribe didn't know it was illegal according to Canadian law. But that defense didn't work, as Joseph was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. After appealing the ruling, he was pardoned in 1909, but before he heard the news that he was a free man, he died in his cell. After the 1920s, there were fewer and fewer Wendigo sightings. Tribal communities had moved into cities, and there were fewer and fewer remote areas where the beast could stay hidden until finding its next victim. But the Wendigo sightings have never stopped. In northern Ontario, there's a place known as the Cave of the Wendigo, and there are two lakes named after it. Lake Wendigo in Minnesota and Wendigo Lake in Wisconsin. And these areas are all known as hotspots. For Wendigo attacks and encounters. There have also been recent sightings in the town of Kenora in Ontario, which is known as the Wendigo capital of the world. In 2019, there were reports of a Wendigo in the forests of northwestern Ontario. A man named Gino Makies took his wife and grandson out hunting in the forest. They were hunting for grouse, which is a type of large bird. He was a very experienced hunter and knew how to recognize the sounds and tracks of every wild animal in the region. And they were over 30 miles away from the closest town. And as they walked along a trail on their way back to the car, they heard a loud terrifying sound. After the first shriek, Gino thought it was a moose. But as the shrieking continued, 
he realized it was unlike anything he had ever heard before. The shrieks turned into howls and started getting closer and closer to Gino and his family. He stopped to listen, but his wife was much more scared than curious at that point. She had even picked up their grandson and started insisting that they head back to the car. Gino decided to record the sound as their grandson tried to mimic it. Here's that sound. After listening to the sound in the video, people have guessed that it could have been a large wolf or a grizzly bear, although grizzly bears have never been seen in this area. Others thought it could be Bigfoot, but the sound seemed too terrifying to be that of the ape-like Sasquatch. The best explanation may be that the mysterious disturbing sounds heard in the distance in Gino's video are coming from a starving Wendigo, close to death and desperate for food. Biologists have listened to the recording, and they of course don't think that the sounds are from a cryptid or other unidentified creature, but they also admit that they don't know what it is. According to Jolanta Kolowski, the media relations officer for the Ontario's Ministry of Resources and Forestry, their best guess is it's the sound of a large mammal. The Wendigo hasn't been a fixture in Western pop culture for very long though, which may be why many people thought of Bigfoot before Wendigo when watching Gino's video. It was first made popular in 1910 when Algernon Blackwood's novel called The Wendigo was published. And since then, the fascinating and terrifying legend has been used in multiple novels, films, TV shows, comic books, graphic novels, and even video games. Yeah, there's a Wendigo video game. Busch Gardens Williamsburg even has a large animatronic version of the Wendigo that's chained inside a cage in an area known as the Wendigo Woods. And I see why. It's absolutely terrifying creature. But to end off this episode, I wanted to read a encounter that somebody believes they had with a Wendigo out of Wisconsin. Because it's just, it's really, you know, it's one thing to hear it coming from, you know, history. But it's another thing to hear it coming from somebody who experienced this pretty recently. And this is actually posted by the Wisconsin Frights blog. And it comes from a man named David W who sent a distressed email with this encounter in it. So this experience that David had happened in Manitowoc County, Wisconsin. And David was just hunting in Point Beach State Forest in Two Rivers where they moved to only a few months prior. And they were still very unfamiliar with this area. David wrote that him and his wife were walking a bridal trail bow hunting in a pissing swamp state natural area when he started to feel like something was watching him. David kept it to himself. However, they had continued walking the trail until they reached a point where the path branched off to the right and a snowmobile trail went to the left. David said that he went to that corner the last few days, but always stopped because he just had an odd feeling about continuing. They had just moved to Two Rivers a few months ago and weren't familiar with the area and they had just started hunting there a few days prior, and the odd feeling had been enough to convince David to turn back on previous excursions. This time, though, something would convince him to ignore that feeling to go further. As David and his wife reached the fork, something not far off the trail ran off through the woods. David said it seemed so big as it ran that I felt it in the ground. Believing it must have just been a large buck, the couple proceeded down the trail, hoping to get a glimpse of it. They found it about 50 yards up, where the trail opened into a stand of tall pines. It was behind a tree, and at first appeared to be a bear standing on its back legs, scratching its back against a tree trunk. David said that it kept stepping to the side, and I could see what looked to be a shoulder and a really long arm. It looked black, really black. And then it did something funny, almost like it got down on all fours, and I thought I saw what would be its head, but it was very oddly shaped, almost like a football, but horizontal with very long ears pointing up into the back, and I thought what I believed to be very long, almost grayish hair. David estimated the creature to be about 8 to 10 feet tall with long, thin, gangly arms. 
He and his wife watched it briefly, unable to understand what they were looking at, and then it took three large steps and disappeared into the underbrush. They slowly walked toward the tree where the creature had been standing, and that's where they saw large impressions in the ground. David thought maybe it had been another hunter dressed in a ghillie suit, though he knew it was way too tall to be human. Hello? He said quietly, and there was no response. He called out a few more times, but there was only silence. David said that he decided they better get the hell out of there because it was starting to get dark, and they were both pretty freaked out at that point. And all the way back, out of the woods, it felt like somebody was trailing alongside them on the trail keeping up with them as they walked very fast. About a quarter mile from the road where their vehicles parked, David and his wife walked out of the forest into a field. They saw a deer there, standing sideways out in the open. A perfect shot. They had come out to hunt after all, so David raised his bow and knocked an arrow. I used the lighted knock so you can see the trajectory of my arrow. And when I shot, David said, you could see that I shot low and I heard something like my arrow hitting something. But I wasn't sure if I hit the deer or not. So he walked over there and started looking for my arrow, still constantly watching around near us. But we couldn't find my arrow anywhere. And then David spotted the glowing knock about 20 or 30 yards back towards the woods and the path. David said his arrow was stuck basically vertical in the ground except for leaning the opposite way I shot which to me and my wife seemed impossible that my arrow could be that way in the ground. And as they made their way back toward the road to leave, a strong odor filled the air. David said, I smelled the most horrible smell I've ever smelled in my life, like rotten mud and sulfur. The smell was just so nasty it was filling up his entire face and lungs. His wife smelled it as well, and later described it to him as a very strong metallic odor of metal. They hurried back to their vehicle and went home, but that night still haunts David. He said, I'm a very avid bow hunter and I've spent most of my life out in the woods, but I've never encountered anything like this or have felt the feeling I felt when I was out there. The experience has left David feeling uneasy about going back out into the woods and is questioning whether he will ever go out hunting again. And he's hoping to find answers by sharing his story. Well, that's just insane, honestly. I mean, I my first thought was exactly his first thought, either a bear scratching mm-hmm. themselves against a tree, because, I mean, if a pretty big bear could st- easily stand 8 feet 10 or 8 to 10 feet tall yeah. and rub their back on the tree, but then he saw the it had gangly arms. And that right there, as soon as I heard gangly arms, I'm like, oh. Yeah, I can't think of any animal that, I know if that has stands on two feet and then jumps down on four feet to run. Yeah. Yeah. Really very bizarre. Yeah. Really creepy. And then the fact that he smelled like a horrible smell too and felt like something was watching them the entire time had to be something intelligent because an animal probably wouldn't stalk you like that. And what animal is going to basically get off a rotting decaying flesh smell? None. None. None that I, unless it's literally dying. And, yeah, if they're wounded know, or something. Yeah, but. something like that. But I don't know, man. I mean, and he's in Wendigo territory, so who knows? Yeah, who knows? What who he knows? Saw. I wonder if anyone out there has a similar story to David. If you do, definitely let us know because very interested to see if anyone has ever felt like they may have encountered a Wendigo. It's very similar to a skinwalker, I feel like. Yeah, they're shapeshifter. Like, obviously different in appearance but like yeah. the fact that they are basically like a possessed human being uh-huh. it's interesting to think you know we always think about demons and like the faith-based sen- sense of it being mm-hmm. like you know from the devil and hell and stuff it's interesting to think of a, a demonic entity that is you know really just a spiritual being that is a combination of animal and human and you know kind of fusing the two together yeah. to create this horrific beast i mean it's really really intriguing to me honestly and i found it very interesting how it's always hungry for for blood and and flesh and you know that specific characteristic makes me think of a vampire so it's it's kind of interesting how it has similar characteristics to some yeah. of these other cryptids yeah 
but it's i mean it's really a cannibal yeah so at, at the end of the day <laughs> the wendigo is just a straight cannibal uh, if you are a cannibal then uh, watch out you might turn into a, a wendigo very creepy though it i is. mean just the the actual look of these wendigos is uh, be absolutely terrifying to run into in the, in the forest yeah i feel like there's there's definitely been some movies too where they kind of play off of this type of character you know I, i'm trying to think there's one on netflix that i watched called the ritual or something oh yeah um no that that is a good example because kind of the creature similar. was like a uh, had antlers yeah yeah and all I, that too, yeah that's so. what it was yeah we'll we'll throw a little clip in there if you can yeah. but there was a creature in there and it's like in the middle of the forest and this like spiritual being that all these people like worship. And yeah, I, I think God, it probably is like inspired from the Wendigo. Yeah, I think legend. so. Cause I think that's, that's exactly what I'm thinking of. So yeah, yeah I don't know, man, this one's a, a really creepy cryptid for sure. Uh-huh. I think I'd rather meet the Mothman or, yeah. <laughs> or Bigfoot well, the, or something yeah, Bigfoot. before I meet the Mothman's Wendigo. Mothman's freaky. Yeah. Mothman so. is kind of scary too, but yeah, I guess they're all kind of, creepy i guess you really want to meet any cryptids yeah even the goat man running around yeah, with an seriously, axe yeah, like, seriously yeah uh, man these cryptids are really interesting to me because I, I don't put it out of the realm of possibility obviously any rational person out there would be like yeah this is just legends just stories just folklore you know there's no evidence there's no definitive proof of it no physical proof nobody's captured a picture of one mm-hmm. that's been confirmed to be be real so but at the end of the day, you can't rule out the possibility that these things are, you know, kind of walking the different dimensions or the spiritual realm. And yeah. they do have this ability to sort of disappear when they want to and appear when they want to. And honestly, I'm, I wouldn't put it past, you know, this world and just all the possibilities of there being something like this. I mean, there's so many cases of people going missing in the forests of, of this country and all over the world if you've ever heard of the missing 411 phenomenon where just the amount, sheer amount of people that go missing in national parks and state parks and things like that in this country without a trace too, like it's one thing for somebody to get lost and you know, you find their body, but there's people that literally vanish without a trace in these forests, oh, well. never to be seen again. Hunters even uh, go out yeah. hunting and, and literally are gone. Just no sign anywhere. And then wow. they search these areas heavily and they never find anything at all. And it makes you wonder, it really makes you think, you know, kind of outside the box of possibilities. Like if it isn't some madman running around the forest, killing people and, or being abducted or something like that, what else is there? And it really leaves you with something like a Wendigo or some type of interdimensional beast or being or something that could be responsible. I don't know. It's it's really really crazy to think about. Yeah, it is. Honestly, gives me chills thinking about wandering through a, a dark forest and encountering one of these things so and you know being a shapeshifter that is it's just crazy to think that something could just quickly appear out of nowhere or lure you lure you in yeah and then just hearing help in the forest yeah (laughs) say you're walking in the forest you Mm -hmm. know say you go hiking by yourself and all of a sudden you hear help me help me help me would you go would you go and help them would you try to go towards it oh shit i mean it really depends on the situation obviously i would want to help somebody uh you know yeah yeah i think everybody's first instinct would be to run towards the person screaming for help but when you know this information you start thinking about other possibilities like you don't know what they're encountering could be something like this something like this or even somebody just trying to lure you into the forest to do whatever yeah I don't know. Pretty creepy stuff. It is spooky. But you'll have to let us know what you think of this episode of the Lights Out Podcasts. Make sure you leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. We really appreciate it. It does help us stay in those rankings. And yeah, make sure you subscribe to us on YouTube and follow us on Spotify and follow us on social media at Lights Out Cast, yeah. Twitter and Instagram. We post a lot of good stuff there, highlights, things like that, announcements. You know, if we're going to have to miss an episode or something like that, that's how you keep up with us. That's where we post all of that. So make sure you're following us on all platforms. But we'll go ahead and leave it there today. We'll see you guys next week with another episode of the Lights Out podcast. But until then, lights out, everybody.